Good evening, everyone. We continue on our study in 2 Samuel chapter 21. We are quickly moving towards the end of this book and then into 1 Kings. We come into chapter 21 after we left off uh, yesterday in chapter 20, and we see this as a new narrative. The word now, as you can see here, uh, is a consecutive. It is an and then idea, meaning this happens after chapter 20. It says here there was a famine in the days of David. Now the word famine is quite interesting. Uh, the word famine comes from the word hunger. And because the Hebrew words are very uh, concrete. And so the idea of a famine gives us a picture where people are hungry, uh, they have little or not enough to eat. That is the idea of a famine. And it's in the days of David, and now David is pretty old, uh, probably around 80. And it happened for three years, year after year. So there are three years there. And then we find that this word is and then as well. And then David sought the presence of the Lord. Now the word the presence of the Lord is literally the face of God. So he is in trouble, and after three years, he is, he's seeking what, uh, what, what should he do? What is happening? Uh, because it is a very unusual uh, in, in the situation where the famine continues for three long years. Now understand the number three, we've seen that before, um, where Amasa uh, was delayed for three days. Uh, he was given three days and didn't come. Now, the word the number three uh, gives us a picture of a uh, sufficiently long time. Sufficiently long. And so after three years, it is sufficiently long to David that something needs to be done. And so he came to the face of God. And in, and in so doing, God responded and the Lord said, it is because of Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, this is fairly cryptic to most of us when we read this in the English. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at the first portion. The first one says, because of Saul. Now, this word, because of Saul, uh, literally means it's regarding Saul, right? It's regarding Saul. Now, Saul has been out of this picture for quite some time, at least close to uh, the 30 over, close to 40 years. And it says, God says, this is about Saul. Uh, and about his well, and I, I guess this is another word. There's another regarding, right? There's another one here which is missing. It is regarding Saul and it's regarding his bloody house. Now, the word bloody house is, um, is about the, the house of blood. No, it, it, it's, let me just put it here. Uh, the house of of bloods. No, this may not be sounding very English, or I'm just giving you the literal translation. It means that Saul has a lot of blood, right? A lot of blood accounted to his house. And in this case, God gives the, the reason. 
right? The word uh, because this is you can say uh, concerning. Uh, yeah, I guess you can say because and it's concerning concerning the fact that he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, this is something that we need to just quickly uh, point out, that we do not have a clear, uh, a clear text that mentioned about the Gibeonites being killed by Saul. And so much of it has been referred to, to 1 Samuel chapter 22, and perhaps in chapter 22, verse 19, we remember Doeg, uh, the Edomite, when he was chasing after uh, David, and David was running, and he was at north, right? At north, he killed all the priests. But in verse 19, it also said that he killed the men and women and children as well. And it appears that in um, in, in Jewish commentary, a Jewish uh, rabbinical commentary, uh, it is said that the in, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 19, included seven Gibeonites. Now, who are the Gibeonites? The Gibeonites, according to Joshua chapter 9, and uh, in 27, they were the ones that who were supposed to have, well, I guess, kind of misled Joshua after Joshua uh, had demolished uh, I, and uh, they pretended that uh, they were from afar, and Joshua uh, took pity on them. And finally, uh, there was a peace treaty with the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites are uh, the Canaanites, the people who were there uh, when Joshua came in for the conquest. And at the end of the day, in that peace treaty, uh, in First Samuel, uh, in Joshua chapter 9, at the end of it, verse 27, they became the woodcutters and the water carriers for the congregation. Uh, and so it is thought that when Doeg killed the priests, the men, the women and children there, there were seven Gibeonites who were killed. And so this is that issue that God had to bring to the attention of David. In verse 2, it says, So, and this is, and then, as God has mentioned about the Gibeonites and what Saul had done, the word he here is literally Doeg acting on behalf of Saul. And so David called the Gibeonites, spoke to them, and now we are told, again, the Gibeonites were not the sons of Israel, they are not Israelites, they are the remnants, the, the few of the Amorites that weren't killed, and the sons of Israel had made a covenant with them, and this would be in Joshua chapter 9. So you can refer to Joshua chapter 9. But Saul had sought to kill them in the zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. And so this is thought to be done by Doeg. Now we move to verse 3 to see how David intended to resolve this situation because the famine is an indication that God is imposing suffering upon the children of Israel. In verse 3, uh, we read here, and then, which is missing. David said to the Gibeonites, What should I do for you? And with what? And how can I make amends? Now, the word amends comes from the word kafar. And this is how we would call atonement. And so if you would like, this would be, how can I atone, make atonement? And the whole idea of at 
atonement here, uh, I guess you would say that uh, how can I make up, right? Make up for it. How can I cover uh, over the wrongs? Right? Cover over the wrongs. Uh, that's what it means by atone. How can I pacify or appease? And so what would have happened is the Gibbonites would have in the history uh, a black mark. And uh, all because of Saul and probably Doeg had killed the Gibbonites and there was no, no recourse. Uh, nobody was able to go and complain about Saul. And so they kept it within themselves for all this while. And God says, I want to deal with this sin or this wrong or this crime. And so this is the idea of atone. That's why David says, how can I atone for this? And uh, to make amends is how the NASB speaks of atonement. And so atonement really is to make up so that the Gibeonites will not feel bad. Uh, they will not feel that they have been wrong and, and no justice was done. And so justice has to be done in that sense. And so that you will bless the inheritance of the Lord. And the idea of bless means to pronounce good things and to do good things in the land of Israel that God has given to Israel. And, has, and, and they are now living there among the Benjamites. Verse 4. Verse 4 is, again, and then after David said all these things, the Gimbanites replied. He says, For us it is not a matter of gold or silver with Saul and his house. There's nothing about money nor is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. And, and this idea here is it's not for us means uh, we do not care. Right? And that's what they say. I, I, I don't want to see anybody dying. Uh, and, and they have, well, I guess you can say they have sort of given up on any recourse of whatever Saul had done. And that was like almost 40 years ago. But David, in verse 4, nevertheless, is and then, even after the Gibeonites said that, David said, I will do whatever you say. And this is a, I guess you can say this is a blank check. The, the king of Israel, David, is willing to make amends, to atone. And it's so important because it is an instruction of God. Because of this, that is, the justice is not served, God has put the, the famine, the hunger upon the children of Israel at this time. And now in verse 5, and so, and then because of what David said, and then they said to the king, this is the man who destroyed us and who planned to eliminate us so that we would not exist within the border of Israel. And so this whole idea here is, is, is that attempt to really, uh, well, we, we don't know the, the background, but this is the complaint that Saul had along the way tried to uh, eliminate or or exterminate uh, the Gibeonites. And in verse 6, says, let seven men from his sons be given to us. And so that is why the uh, Jewish commentary says that there were seven who died. And so not everybody died, but seven. And seven men from the Gibeonites died. And so they seek seven lives from the sons of Saul, from the sons of Saul, be given to us and we will hang them before the Lord in 
the hill of Saul. Uh, Giva is is hill. In the hill of Shaul, I think if you want to put it that way. And the idea of uh, hang, right? The idea of hang. Well, I guess you can say this word is execute. And it is execution by dislocating. And I guess this one you say dislocating uh, the joint. And, uh, and so we'll put it here. This would mean by dislocating the joint. And this would be the neck. And Saul is also uh, understood. Uh, Saul is understood as the chosen of God. That God had chosen him. He is the chosen one. So here is chosen among the tribes to be king. And this is done by God. And the king says, I will give. I will give. Now the question is, we are not told, and, and this, this chapter has a lot of things that we don't have background to it. And that's why it gives us a bit of a problem. And so the question that we would need to ask is, how is the king going to choose? Which seven, right? Which seven is going to be given over to the Gibbonites? And so we are reading in verse seven, it says, the king spared Mephi Voshet, the son of your Nathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath of the Lord between them. And so remember, Jonathan and David had a, a, a formal oath to spare, to take care of the household of Jonathan. But in verse 8 is where we see that there is a number of people involved and seven out of these people were chosen. And so we need to ask that question and we're not told. Now in verse 8, so, and then, and then the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah. Understand that this would be in, um, two sons of Rizpah, and Rizpah would be in 2 Samuel. Chapter 3, verse 7. So there are two sons of Rispa. And then we have Amorni, uh, Armoni and Mephivoshet. So now we have two, one, one, uh, and this would be the two sons who she bore uh, to Saul, uh, the daughter of Ayad, the five sons of, and this one in the text, it is actually Mikal. But understand that Merav was actually the daughter of Saul who married Adriel. Uh, and the five sons of Merav after she died was taken care of by Mikal. So that would be how the text would have referred to the five sons because Mikal had no children. And this would be uh, Adriel, the son of Barzillai. Now, now we see we have seven individuals here, right? Two and five. In verse 9, 
And then David handed them over to the Gibeonites. Now remember, there were seven of them. Two sons of Ritzpah. The five sons of Michal, and I'll put here slash Merav. And so we have seven. And these are the seven who were brought over to the Gibeonites. And so in verse 9, it says, after giving over to the Gibeonites, and then the Gibeonites hang them on the mountain before the Lord. And, and hanged is correct, but basically it is to, uh, to, to execute them so that the seven of them fell together. Uh, and, and this would mean that the hanging, right? The hanging was, con uh, was simultaneous. And then they were, they were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Uh, this would be in the month of Nisan or Aviv. And in the first days means it's in the early days of the barley harvest. Verse 10. After this happened, so this is an and then statement, Ritzpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread out for herself on the rock uh, from the beginning of the harvest until it rained on them from the sky. Uh, this would be the, uh, the spring rains. And she allowed neither the birds of the sky to rest on them by day, nor the wild animals by night. This is a period of mourning. This is a period of mourning. The next verse here, verse 11, when it was reported, the word when is and then, after, you know, when this was happening, and then it was reported to David, what Ritzpah, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done. Verse 12. This is, and then, remember this is a narrative. It's sequence after sequence. David went. Now, David went, or David walked, uh, and then, he took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan from the citizens of Yabesh Gilad. Remember, Yabesh Gilad at the end of First Samuel, uh, that they that the the uh, Philistines hanged uh, Saul and his sons, uh, and the citizens of Yabesh Gilad came to steal them from Bethshan. And after that, you find that um, they had not properly buried uh, Saul and uh, the, the, the sons uh, because they, they didn't want to uh, in, uh, upset the Philistines. And after stealing them, they had very quickly, I, I imagine very quickly and very quietly buried uh, the Saul and Jonathan. Verse 13, and he brought up from there, there would be Yabesh Gilad, the bones of of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan. Uh, and in verse 13, and then 
they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. And that would be the seven of the sons of Saul. So all in all, there would be nine sets of bones. Verse 14. Then it will be, and then, because after they gathered, then they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the country of Benjamin in Zelah. In the grave of his father, Kish. Now understand that the idea here is, Although the, the English word is bury, right? the English word is bury, kavar, uh, you, we need to realize that the burial here, the burial, is in a cave. It is not dug into the ground in that sense, right? And so this, then, and that if you happen to go to the 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 land of Israel in Jordan, you no, know, in Petra, the graves in those days were really a cave, uh, a hole in the side of a hill, and so there they laid the the bones together with kish, and so they did everything the king commanded, and after that God responded to prayer for the land. Now, we need to look at this word, right? Prayer. Uh, this word responded to God for, uh, res God responded to prayer for the land um, can be translated and God was entreated for the land after that. Slightly different from this translation here. Now, what does that mean? It means that um, uh, it means that they prayed to God for, for rain. They prayed to God, uh, how should we say? They prayed to God uh, to, to seek Him to remove the famine uh, for whatever they have planted, for God to uh, allow the land to be prosperous again. I think that would be a better way of understanding this phrase and treat for the land. Uh, the, the idea here is to, to pray to God in, in, in our language, uh, it is to ask God uh, to release them from this burden of famine. That, that is how it is said. It, the, we don't see the word prayer used. Um, it's not the typical word for praying, although the English word here, pray, is used, but it is not that word. So to entreat God is to ask of God, maybe, yeah, to ask of God, uh, to call on God to listen to their plight. I think that would be a better way of understanding it. And they are in a famine. And as they call on God to uh, release them from the hunger, uh, and after doing all these things, and verse 14 literally says, um, and God heeded, God responded, God uh, listened to their call after this. So you find that God has first told David what to do, why the famine was there. David did exactly what God said. And this represents a man after God's heart. 
whatever God instructs, he goes to do it. And after doing everything, uh, which is regarding uh, Saul, uh, the burial, it is regarding the Gibeonites issue of the house of blood. Uh, and after these things were resolved, then God responded. And you find that this is a very unique situation. It's not happening all the time. It's, it's, it's this particular chapter 21 that God had to deal with this with regards to Saul before David dies. And so it's within the memory of the people then. Now, very quickly, we will come and uh, wrap up the rest of this chapter. The rest of this chapter is regarding a series of battles. Verse 15. This word here is, and then. There was a battle that the Philistines, with the Philistines again, David went down, his servants with him, that's the army. Uh, and when they fought against the Philistines, David became weary. And this word weary uh, literally means uh, to feel faint, right? to feel faint, uh, to feel faint. Or become faint. Now, maybe his blood pressure had gone down, but the whole idea here is that he he became uh, he had had dimness in the head. This is not weary in that sense, right? Not weary in this sense. He feel lightheaded. Uh, possibly he had low blood pressure. Not sure. But the idea here is he's beginning to be lightheaded and he cannot function properly anymore. Verse 16. And as he felt faint, this guy here is the name of uh, Ish Benov. Ish Benov. Uh, uh, Ish B. Uh, Benov. Ish B. Benov. Ish B would be the name. Benov means in Nov. In Nov, right? And so this is the name. Ishbi in North, he was among the, the sons. Uh, he was a he was a young man, someone who was born of the giant. Now, let's ignore this word giant. The word here is Rafa. Rafa. And we have read that in Deuteronomy as well. Because the Rafa was there uh, with the Anakim, uh, with the Seir, uh, then with the Moabites, with the Ammonites, and even in uh, Bashan, right? There were uh, the Rafa. The weight of his spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight. He had strapped a new sword and he intended to kill David. And he intended means he was saying. And this is the word he, he said. Right? He said. He was saying to kill David. He intended to kill David. He was uttering the words that he wants to kill David. And that is what this word actually means, intended. Verse 17. But would be, and then, remember there were the two brothers, Avishai and Yoav. Avishai, the son of Zeruiah, helped him. And then, uh, 
struck the Philistine and then he died. Then David's men swore to him saying, you shall not go out again with us to battle. Right? Uh, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. So understand this. David is seen as the lamp of Israel, the Ne'er, uh, the lamb, not the light, right? the lamb, something that is, uh, I would say, something that is, um, something that's bright. This is the source of light. Source of light of Israel. Right, of Israel. Because everyone is looking at him. So you do not extinguish. Extinguish means do not let it go out. Do not quench it. Do not let it go out. Now, why is this? Because he was faint. He couldn't defend himself. So Avishai had to do that job to strike at this Philistine who was trying to kill David. Now, killing David is equal to putting out the land of Israel. So that is uh, what this means. Verse 18. Now, this would be, and then, as you can see, this is a series of battles came about after this. There was war again with the Philistines at Gov. Now, this word Gov is another place. And then we have this person, uh, Sibkai, uh, the Hushatite is Sibkai. And he struck and killed Saf. And he was among the those who were born of. No, this the word descendants is born of. Not the giant, but the Rafa. The Rafa. Uh, by the word Rafa, it, it has a different meaning altogether. Verse 19. And then. Notice this is another, another war. There was war with Philistines at Gov, same place. And Elhanan, the king of Yare, uh, uh, ya Yare, uh, the, the weaver, okay, is a, he is a weaver from Bethlehem. Now he, he killed. Or he slew. Uh, he used his uh, he used his uh, sword to kill. Now this is not Goliath the uh, Gittite. Uh, when we read in, I think we read in Second Chronicles. I think we have Second Chronicles. Um, let's see. Second, uh, First Chronicles. In First Chronicles, chapter twenty and verse five, uh, we are told that this is the brother, and his name is uh, Lachmi. And so it is said that whenever you have the Relationships in the Hebrew concept, uh, brothers are, are treated as uh, themselves, sisters are treated as themselves, like Mikal and Merav, like Goliath and his brother. Right? It, it's the way that the, the Hebrew uh, context of relationships are used. And we are saying that the shaft of his spear is like a weaver's beam. It's, it's big, right? It's big. 
The verse 20 again, and then this is a series of wars. This time is at Gath. And there was a man who was, well, I guess great stature, was tall and big. He had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. You can count 24 in number. And he was born to the Rafa. The Rafa. And in verse 21, this is, and then in the war itself, he, he, he defied Israel. And the word defy here is taunt. He taunted uh, Israel. And so, Jonathan, Yehonatan, uh, the son of Shim, Shimah, right? David's brother. Uh, Shimah, David's brother, uh, we have here is either Shim'i or Shimah. David's brother struck and killed him. So this is another one. This is the fourth of them. Verse 22, these four were born to the Rafa. The Rafa. At Gath. And these are Philistines. And they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, I guess you can say uh, this would be an A and a B. The way that the Hebrew expresses ideas like this, uh, they fell meaning they were cut down, they were slain. By the hand of David is the same as by the hand of his servants. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 21 was that all his servants were the ones who slew the, the, those who were born of the Rafa, all four of them. But in the way it is expressed by the hand of David, just like Saul didn't kill the Gibeonites, Saul knew somebody else, but it is ascribed to Saul. So oftentimes when you read in the Bible, uh, we get kind of a confused mode because we read that David didn't kill, but it was other people who killed. Why is it ascribed to David? But Because David is the king. And so they were acting on behalf of the king. They were delegated and empowered of authority to take action for the king. And same with Saul, it was ascribed to Saul for the death of the Gibeonites because Saul had given the instructions to go out and deal with the Gibeonites. I think one, um, one other thing I would like to say in, in closing is that when you read in this chapter that there were four more sons of the Rapha, it appears, it appears that when David was going up against Goliath and he picked five stones, that these four would also have been there. And so David actually had seen five heads above all the heads of the Philistines, which was why he picked five stones. And so the five stones that David picked uh, may not be arbitrary, but be very strategic that uh, he would be able to kill them all if they had attacked him but he only needed one to take care of Goliath. And so these four uh, brothers uh, were not uh, killed at that time because the Philistines withdrew. But at the end of the life of David was when the rest of them were killed by his servants. And with this, we come to the end of chapter 21.